Hello, I'm Carl Wells, and this is Point to Point. My guest today is Guy Matthews. You may know him as Reverend Guy. For most of his life, he's ministered to his fellow human beings and supported them through difficult periods in their lives. Today, we're going to spend the entire half hour chatting with Guy about a personal challenge of Guy's. Um, recently, he underwent successful heart transplant surgery. And Guy, I'm really happy to have you here. And, and I'm really glad to be here. It's wonderful <laughs> to see you looking so well. It is good to be well. Um, can you tell us about the very first time in your life uh, you were told that you, you might have a problem with your heart? Well, I'll go back even a little further. I'm familiar with heart disease because in the house that I grew up, my grandparents lived with me. My grandfather, who was probably in his 50s at the time, was already off work because of heart issues, uh, not quite as well understood as what we have now, and came to St. John's and had some very primitive heart treatments and surgeries. My dad died in 1982 at the age of 49, very similar symptoms. When I was nine, I was diagnosed with a heart murmur, and from then on, I was followed, but not, not realizing where the disease was going. Uh, after, uh, before my dad died, of course, this became a bit more prevalent at 18 or 19, and then from there on I started getting followed, and after my dad died, it was, we understood it was a genetic condition. And, uh, and Did you was, have any, any symptoms at, the, at that age, no, that early age? Very little, but I was told that I had asthma, and I found that I didn't like sports that took a lot of running or speed. I, I, like, I would play catcher in baseball or a goalie in hockey. Simply, and, and didn't like soccer, didn't like basketball, and I come to realize because I had trouble breathing, and, and the assumption was asthma, but I was told later on that it wasn't. It was how my heart and lungs were not working together. So that was probably the first sign. But other than that, no, I didn't. So receiving the kind of diagnosis you did at such a young age, did that affect you emotionally? How, how did you feel about it? I probably didn't feel a whole lot about it till my dad died. And I, I went through a period of, uh, you know, thinking, well, you know, if I'm going to get this anyway, not not really what, what's not the point, but, you know, well, even, you know, I, I, I broke up with the person who, who I'm now married to with the thought, like, what's the point anyway when you're going to probably die in your, when you're 50? But, you know, that's just a part of processing that whole thing, because it's not easy as a young person uh, understanding that you may have a disease that may drastically affect your life or shorten your life. So you did indeed feel that you were living on borrowed time. Well, I mean, uh, 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 funny because the original doctor who diagnosed me in Newfoundland, I was misdiagnosed in Montreal after an extensive checkup at the age of 17, told I had a bicuspid or split valve. And when I saw an internist, uh, back when I went started to college in St. John's, you know, in 10 minutes he said to me, oh, no, 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 you don't have that. You have a, a genetic uh, condition called IHSS, a cardiomyopathy. You're not going to have any symptoms till you're past your 40th birthday, which my dad did. And at the age of 40 is when I really started to notice a difference. But I, you know, dealt with that. But I lived normally pretty well, just medications to mitigate um, the, uh, enlargement of the heart and that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, that, that's what I was going yeah. to ask you. So when you got to middle age, yeah. um, the medical treatment more or less kicked in and yeah and it was well, the it, was symptoms it? kicked in because you know I found myself in atrial fib atrial fibrillation very at a very dangerous level uh, ended up hospitalized uh, a few months after that took a pacemaker which I had for 18 months uh, then I was about 42 then and uh, then uh, one day walking one Friday walking down Cam Mount Road uh, for my usual Friday morning walk, I, I collapsed on Thorburn Road. My heart had stopped. Oh and I went face onto the pavement, broke my leg, did a bunch of other damage, and basically hopped home because I was up the street from where I lived. And from there on, it became defibrillators and ablations and a whole bunch so of processes. You, so what, your heart stopped and then started on its own again? The impact on the sidewalk was the diagnosis. Oh. But it was, yeah. So it was the fact that you fell that... Shocker Probably, heart. like no one knows for sure, but that was the, the assumption at the wow. time. It was the, it was it was that. So it was kind of scary <laughs> for everybody. It was yeah. Uh, yeah. So then on, it just got worse. The, the 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 defibrillator went in, and you know that fired on a number of occasions, and and uh, 
Well, you knew me from mm -hmm. Gower Street, of mm -hmm. course, and I, by that time I got to a point where just doing normal things was very hard to function. Yeah. And uh, we saw my doctor back then in, in the fall of, of uh, 2015 and finally said, you know, this is enough of this, you yeah. need to give up work. So, um, I was going to ask you though, before, before that actually yeah. happened, <coughs> what, what kind of uh, impact did it have on your, your lifestyle and, and uh, in the workplace? Well, De Deanna describes it best. Deanna's my wife, of course, and she always says to people, you know, it was as if our life constantly got chipped away at. Things you took for normal this year were not normal next year, so you had to adjust to where you went, what you did, the plans you made, how you functioned normally. And we became quite good at it, you know. She's very, very patient, and, and uh, we became quite good at the normal thing was to adjust to what was new. And so it was, that was always constantly changing, so you always felt you could either resist it and become bitter about it, or you could roll with the changes and try to do the best that you could, and that's what we tried to do. Our kids were always involved in the conversation. They knew from an early age what the, you know, what the score was, and we thought that was important. So all of this, all the way through, they've been very much a part of the, the, the whole process. It must have been scary for them, though. Had to be. Like, mm. I mean, the first time I was hospitalized, they were whew, probably eight or nine. Mm. And I mean, as any kid, you know, you're around your dad, and you don't think they're going to end up in the hospital, and that's a big deal. And, you know, especially in, with cardiac issues, and you're kind of over there hooked up to machines. There's not a whole lot you can just waiting to get better to come home. So that has to be. And you know, then we work through the whole idea of testing with them and all that kind of piece. But we really don't have anything to test against because it's been a long time trying to isolate this particular gene. And a couple of times it felt like they were close, but still haven't isolated it. It's not like the ARVC gene, which is very common that you hear a lot about in the news and a lot of people suffer from and many people have had transplants for. That's more of a, as I understand it, an electrical type of issue where the heart stops to function, almost like throwing a switch. Mm -hmm. And that's well known, well documented, and the research here is, you know, world renowned for, for that kind of thing. Is, is this a gene which is common in Newfoundlanders or? We don't know because it hasn't been isolated yet. Okay. They know it's genetic, I guess, by the way the disease performs and its predictability. I don't know the ins and outs of that. But they, the, you know, the, the, the medical people are convinced it's genetic, and there are many forms. And so trying to track these things down in people. And not surprising if it would be in Newfoundland. I mean, you know our close population, which makes us such a good genetic study. Yeah. And uh, so it is. I mean, my dad died of what we assume is the same thing. My grandfather died of what we assume is the same thing. I have a cousin who had a heart transplant in Vancouver three years ago. She's younger than I am. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there's, there's reason to believe that it is uh, yeah. familial. Uh, talk about your faith. Did, did, did that sustain you? Well, it has in every part of my life, not just that. Like, sometimes we think of faith as, you know, get you through the stormy times. No, no, it gets you through everything. And, uh, yeah, it's very important. It's always been a part of my fabric. I mean, you know that. That's who I am. And, uh, you know, the biggest learning in my faith is nothing wrong with doubts. They help you grow, and so when you do, you kind of push through it. And and for us, it's been very important. I mean, you know, you got you got to believe in something bigger than yourself. Mm. And uh, you know, even your worst day can be a good day. Mm. So, eventually, they they suggested a heart <coughs> transplant. First one, first one, the conversation came up early on in this whole process because we knew that the progression of the disease was going to be constant. Uh, towards an end game of a heart that was severely enlarged, with very poor pumping capacity, mm -hmm. and uh, well, that doesn't bode well for anybody. Mm -hmm. So the discussion came around uh, transplant, and the thing was, I was probably too well for a transplant, not well enough to function normally, because it's a big operation, and mm -hmm. the thing they warn you about that I'm living out right now, and so is everybody else who's done through any type of transplant, but particularly heart and lung transplants, is that uh, you virtually exchange a very grave illness for a chronic illness. Mm -hmm. And that chronic illness is the medication management, which is why I'm sitting here with tissues in my pocket because it feels like I always have a cold and part of that is trying to balance my immune system. Out of that comes uh, you know, an elevated risk of certain cancers and other diseases because of the immune system, the aging of the heart faster than normal. So it's a balancing act for the rest of your days. Mm -hmm. So you do exchange that. So they, the point being, they're reticent to say, oh, let's do a transplant right away. Transplant is an act of last resort. 
So when I got off work, I was referred to the wonderful facility here known as the Heart Failure Clinic. Great people. And they kind of coach you through because you're in you know, the latter stages of heart failure. And then when all the drug therapy has been exhausted, which was in my case very promising medications, my body wouldn't work with them. So then it's transplant. So all of a sudden, something that's hypothetical now becomes part of the regular conversation. And boy, that's different. Mm. You know, that's different. And you, you had your transplant in Ottawa, which is, I guess, one of the few facilities uh, in Canada that Actually, does I heart Actually, I think there's six. Oh. There's Halifax, uh, Montreal, mm -hmm. Ottawa, Toronto, Edmonton, and Vancouver, as far as I know. So I think there oh, are six. It's interesting, because most of the yeah. people I hear about yeah. uh, who are from this province end up going to Ottawa. I think the statistic is that 40, uh, sorry, that 25% of the heart transplants done at Ottawa Heart Institute are from Newfoundland and Labrador. Interesting. Yeah. And, and the reason yeah. there's twofold. Uh, one is because they're a top-notch place, as they're all great places, but this is a true institute and recognized you know, beyond our borders for the work that it does. But uh, second of all, too, m I think many of our doctors have trained in Ottawa, so there's a very close liaison. Mm -hmm. So they are very confident in sending you to, to Ottawa, plus the fact that the number that they do, and it seems to be that facilities that do greater numbers have greater success rate, which kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. Halifax does four a year which is not a lot. Ottawa does 40 a year, mm. and it's probably one of the top in Canada. So a lot, right now we were there on Sunday uh, for my nine-month checkup, and th we have the gathering that is called the union meeting on Sunday nights, and it's Newfoundlanders who are there, and so there's various number of people waiting, recovering, back for their checkups. So it's a huge community even within the facility that's there. Wow. Um, so what what did you feel like when you woke up after the surgery? <coughs> well, probably because, more, probably more interesting had, question would be to start how they feel before I went down. And then, well, you know what I mean? Because yeah, it's, well, it's all part of the same let's process. Let's go there because yeah. I, I assume you got, you got a call yeah. and they said, okay, we have a heart. Well, when you go there first, of course, I mean, you're told you're on the list. I mean, so we, we arrived there on 27th of June. On the 29th, I was put on the list, which, by the way, is an anomaly because it's not like a seniority list. There are so many things that have to fall in place. Uh, you know, how serious you are, your blood type, your gender, uh, the body size is huge, and the makeup of your blood, and all those things get thrown into the mix, and then a computer algorithm basically picks out the best candidates for an organ that comes forward. So you're on the list, and then for the first few days, every time the phone rings, you're jumping because it must be the call. And then you get used to the fact that you're being called every day about everything, another blood appointment, another test. And so I was on my way to rehab, and the phone rings, and I saw you know, the coordinator's number, and I thought, okay, what appointment now? And she says to me, Guy, uh, as soon as she said, oh, I said, so, Jackie, we have a heart? And she said, yeah, we think so. Could you go to the surgeon's office now? So Deanna and I went down, and typically it's... You get called, get to the hospital right away. In this circumstance, and I'm sure in others, we were told, heart's available, it's going to be tomorrow. It ended up being 36 hours waiting. So that 36 hours was a bit strange because we knew 36 hours ahead of time that a heart was available. It was going through the testing process, which probably meant that someone was on life support probably nearby. So you go through those emotions. and. Um, so, you know, we were trying to figure out when do we tell our family because the point with this is it can get canceled at any mm -hmm. time during the process that, and they say until the surgeon holds it in their hands, they don't know if it's going in or not. But anyway, all that process, we dealt with that, we let our family know. I was very, very relaxed. I went to sleep for several hours before they woke me for surgery because, you know, it wasn't strange for me because I thought I worked so hard to get here and now it's here. <clears throat> There's no really no need to uh, panic. So that was very peaceful. Going into the room, I knew and met most of the people who were in there, so it was comfortable. And Dan and I had said goodbye, and uh, you know the the feeling I had was, what's the worst can happen? I won't wake up. Mm -hmm. The best is, I'll wake up with a real good chance. And so mm -hmm. that's how I felt. I talked to my dad, as strange as it seems, and and you know, thought if you know. Uh, you know, if if you know you're probably very happy tonight, and I'm sitting lying here kind of feeling a little bad because you were born generation too early. This technology wasn't available to you, and mm -hmm. uh, but that was good. We went you know, to put me to sleep, I mean, right in the middle of conversation, and I was out for the surgery. lasted 
f uh, about four hours and 45 minutes, which is amazing. <coughs> they finished on Thursday morning around 7 o'clock. I didn't, they kept me sedated until 24 hours later. So when I woke up, I had prepared myself for what it would be like waking up, and I had done, uh, convinced myself not to panic with tubes and stuff in. So when I woke up, I had to remind myself, okay, it's just tubes. You know, and, and Deanna was there, and one of our friends uh, and some of her family were there, and uh, I just wanted to know what day it was because I wanted to know how long I was out. So I had, I had spelled out to Deanna, you know, what day, and because uh, I knew the time. But uh, no, it was, it was good. It was weight, it was no pain, no discomfort totally tied down with lines and tubes and hoses and just felt good to be done and everything felt in the right place and sore but not painful and it was did they tell you anything about your donor you, uh, yeah the only thing they did tell me because of confidentiality and the way things work in the system was that you know it was a, a young gentleman who was 19 it had to be my size and and, and uh, because body cavity measurements are very important but it, yeah, that's the only thing I know. It was from the local area, or from what they call Northern Ontario, so it was not far north of Ottawa. Mm -hmm. And it was, it, they were 19, so that's as much as I know. So um, what's your status these days, uh, and your, your prognosis? Uh, well, the prognosis have you had any is, problems, or? No, well, well I, I had problems a week after surgery. I had a buildup of fluid around the heart in the cavity, so I was hospitalized again for a few days. Once that got removed, uh, then things really started to pick up. So physically, I just got back from nine months of checkup, and uh, you know the heart's working really well. And all, all the functions are where they should be or above. Uh, you know, I've done rehab, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one rehab, and that's coming out very well. Still got to manage fatigue. I mean, it's a long time. Your body is in 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 decline for so many years, and then you know you're trying to get back. So that takes a long time. Mentally, it's been the biggest challenge for me because of the massive medication overload, uh, just trying to be sharp. It's, everything takes concentration and I don't trust myself, which is not normally how I function. It's getting better. And trying to be patient is big, but the biggest challenge, I guess, outside of that is balancing the massive medications. There's the scheduling, the care, the recording, the testing, and the side effects. I mean, I take, I take uh, you know, two major uh, immune suppressants heavy doses of prednisone or facilitated and about 15 medications to deal with the side effects. So, so my, my pill box looks like a buffet. It really, it, really, it really does. So that kind of stuff, but it's, it's becoming normalized and it's become less as you progress through the stages. You know, uh, it takes about two years. Do you feel like you've been given a, a new life for a purpose? Well, sure. I mean, you know, the thing is, uh, this is a gift and I, and, and my story is not new. You talk to all the people, one, one of the people I became really, really good friends with and we've built a really good relationship with we transplanted five weeks before me, you know, said, uh, you know, how can you not now give back? Hmm. You don't have a choice. It isn't deciding to. It's just a part of your fabric and, and, and I believe that, you know. No, I mean, I, 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 I enjoy life. I enjoy every single day. I mean, I always have. I've, work has never been work for me. It's been, what, who I am, what I do, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it now takes place in many ways. So, you know, I try to do what I can and what I'm able to do, and uh, trying to learn. I learned very quickly not to push it. I, uh, over Easter, I developed a, uh, a very serious infection that came from antibodies in the heart that I didn't have. I was never exposed to the disease. Fairly normal. Uh, most people have it until your immunity dips. But I was seriously ill, and it's taken me months to manage that. So now I feel like I constantly have a cold. I pick up a flu if someone sneezes miles away. and mm -hmm. But that's a normal part of the process. So it will change going forward, because many of the things I took for granted now become uh, uh, very, very iffy for me in the sense that I had to be very careful around infections, going to places where there's crowds who may have colds or other more serious right. things. So that, that changes really everything going forward, but a relatively normal period of life and, and you know, I need to be patient with the recovery because days you feel like, boy, you know, let me out the door, I want to go to work and you realize at the end of the day, no, 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 I'm not there for quite a while yet and see where that goes. You've had an opportunity to meet with a number of Newfoundlanders who've been organ recipients, not just heart transplant sure. recipients. Um, how, did, how did that go, and, and what kind of discussions have you had with those people? Well, I, I guess like in almost any experience, you find people in communities collect 
you know, in small communities. This one is very unique in a sense that many people feel, in, no matter what the transplant, they've been given either a, a second chance at life or an improved life, depending on the organ, how it goes. Some people, it's not a life-saving organ, but it's certainly a life-transforming experience. That changes people profoundly. And when you, when you sit with people who've had that experience, you understand two things. You're both part of the same book, but all your chapters are different. No two stories are parallel. Everybody's uh, uh, personality, everybody's body, everybody's response to treatment uh, is totally different. So, you know, in any of these things, just the management of, of post-surgery is so complicated that everybody's different. But you have enough in common. Uh, one of the other big pieces, though, and we have done some great things, you know, informally, some of us meet doing uh, information sessions and volunteering for different groups around. We did a, uh, an event for heart patients after I got back, organized with Glenn Stanford and the, uh, the Stanford and, and the, uh, the Growlers, who provided us with a box, and we met down with the medical staff, and that was a great evening. Uh, I had to apologize to the Growlers. We watched about four minutes of the game. The rest was socializing <laughs> and telling stories and, and meeting people for the first time that you felt that you knew for a lifetime because you have a very unique experience, and everybody's changed by it. And I think that change is absolutely fascinating. The second piece of that is, is including the families, particularly the spouses, the, the partners to support people, because they're the unsung heroes in this. And I keep repeating that over and over. They're the people who keep you going. They're the people who are the buffers. They're the people who end up doing most of the worrying. And uh, they're the people who push you when you need one and hold you back when you can't. And uh, like, uh, whatever vows you make to each other are words until you see this stuff happening in real life. And it, they're as much a part of the story. So to get these people together, in, in the case of hearts, predominantly women who are support people because the way the, the, way the demographics break down. But to allow you know, them to get together and share their stories and their fears and realize they're not alone and they've experienced the same thing is a very, very powerful. And we have another event in the planning works now for the end of the summer, but that's very important. But all families are involved in this. I mean, my kids, as I mentioned before, and other people's families, it's a family story. It's not individual. And, you know, the communities you're involved in, it affects everybody. Do you think there's, there's enough um, support out there for people who are um, about to undergo uh, transplants and who are recovering from transplants, and I'm thinking in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the healthcare system and, mm. and other organizations. Well, I mean, the healthcare systems, as in many systems, are designed to deal with the needs up front. Uh, the individuals that we have in the healthcare systems are phenomenal. The people in the clinics, the, the specialists, the people in the whole program are just absolutely unbelievable. And they're personable, they care, they're involved in the stories. Uh, the system itself doesn't always allow for that because the system has to run on as much efficiency as possible and deal with the medical needs. But what's rising up is a push to make these things available, but it's, it's, the real support is coming from the communities themselves. So when we went to Ottawa with as much knowledge as I could gather, and I mean I read everything way too much sometimes, but then you get a chance to meet, you know, we met our good friends, uh, Jimmy and Michelle Sullivan, who were there from Calvert. They were staying in residence and then other people, and to get to know the small things and tell you the story and see it happening is just phenomenal. And then we met quite a number of other people afterwards. So that's very vital. Uh, going in is big. There's so much uncertainty when you're going, you know, for a, for a life-threatening and life-saving procedure that alters you, so many unknowns. The recovery afterwards is equally important because there's issues that come up and you feel like you're all alone and you're not. So even now there's a great sense of community there always needs to be more, and uh, but it's growing, and you know the transplant people, uh, Jonathan Hickman and others are doing great work through you know transplant procurement across the board. Who he himself is is a uh, recipient, but that kind of work needs to be more and more formalized, and it's happening. Yeah. Now um, we have a, a wonderful um, healthcare system, and MCP is great. You know, it pays for your surgery, and but. It's still uh, costly. Uh, there, there is a cost oh, sure which, ha which sure uh, has to be uh, paid. And I know that uh, a lot of your friends and family have helped you financially. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, that must be very meaningful for you. It's very humbling. 
very yeah. meaningful, and, and it is. Uh, it, it becomes a community thing. And the costs are there. I mean, the provincial government program, yes, is great. If we live in other jurisdictions, many of us could never get surgery done. Mm. And we know that, and that's not picking on anybody. It's just we're very fortunate. We don't understand how fortunate we are. You know, there's uh, transplant is in great need. We are a uh, province where transplants aren't done, but harvesting is done. Uh, you need consent, and uh, the family has final consent when it comes to that. So transplanting is, is uh, very important. Donor donating is very important. Everybody needs to get their MCP cards and files up to date, and have a discussion with your loved ones. They're the ones who have the final say in what happens. So it's, it's very frustrating. I do have a unique experience in the sense that I've been a re recipient, and of course I haven't been a donor, but uh, I've worked with families. I've been in the room with parents who's waiting for their daughter to, you know, or their son to go away and have an organ harvested. So it gives me this very profound sense of where this come from, that everybody is thankful, but I look at that experience and think, you know, I've been there with parents and know what that feels like, and so it's a very humbling, very holy moment. It well is. Well said. Thank you, Guy. Thank you. And that's this edition of Point to Point.